Okay, so it's after lunch, and you all have full bellies, and you're going to be asleep in about 10 minutes. So um, I'm fully aware of that, and I won't blame you. Um, but we also don't have a whole lot of time, so I want to go ahead and get through this. I, I, it typically takes me a lot longer to get through this, so this may go um, a little more quickly than... So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of IoT architecture as it relates to InfluxDB and, and how you might organize your, your architecture and your deployment of InfluxDB based on your, on your IoT needs. Um, so there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Centralized data collection versus distributed data collection. Are you going to collect most of your data out at the edge? Are you going to send everything back to the cloud, right? Um, and a lot of that is going to depend on how the data is going to be used and who needs access to the data, as well as some of the infrastructure that you have in place to do that. So all of these things have to be sort of looked into before you decide, I'm going to do all my data collection in the cloud, right? Well, there's a whole bunch of things you need to think about before you make that decision. Um, so let's say you want to collect it all in the cloud. So you're going to send everything from every IoT device to your cloud instance, right? OK, so you need a highly available network. You need a low latency network. You probably need a cheap network because you're going to be sending a lot of data over your network to some you know, remote instance. So you need it to be fairly cheap and definitely high availability. Otherwise, you will lose lots of data. Low latency also. And depending on how critical your data is and especially how critical the alerts on that data are, you may want to rethink that. And I'll give some examples of that as well. Um, The benefit of that is I can do my analysis and my, and my visualizations from anywhere, right? I can build dashboards based on one central source of truth, and I can distribute those dashboards, and everybody can see those dashboards, and they can do their analysis on a central source of truth from all the data, from all my sensors, from anywhere, right? So there's an advantage to it. But depending on things like network availability, latency, cost, and things like that, I might need to collect it much closer to the source, out at the edge. Um, the example I like to use of this is um, I talked to a customer that was, they put oil rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? Um, their backhaul network is a high latency, extremely expensive satellite uplink. Um, they don't really want to send all of their pump data over this satellite network to a back-end system and then back down to the oil rig to do analysis. For alerts, that can be a deadly situation, right? Pump pressure skyrockets and they're waiting for the satellite to make another trip around the globe before the data can get back to the data center and the alert can be generated and then one more trip around before it gets back down. And by the time the alert happens, they had a bigger alert, which was the thing caught on fire and exploded, right? That's not the kind of alert you want. So doing, being able to do the data collection out at the edge is really important. Being able to do not just the data collection, but the analysis and the visualization and the alerting out at the edge is really important. Right, in some scenarios. Um, you may want to do it, let's say you're, multi, you're monitoring multiple oil rigs. You may need to collect data at lots of different collection points out at the edge and then sort of feed those back to a, let's say, a more central location that's not necessarily a back-end cloud situation and then from there feed those back to a cloud, right? So there's this, there's, there can be this layered architecture, and this is what I call a, uh, a data layer for IoT, right? So that I can collect my data, I can store my data, I can analyze my data, I can visualize my data, and I can alert on my data anywhere along this whole collection and, and storage architecture. Whether it's at the extreme edge on an embedded piece of hardware out, you know, embedded in a wall somewhere, I can still collect and store my data there, and I can still generate alerts there, or it's all the way back in the cloud, and I can, I can 
backhaul my data back to the cloud and I can generate some alerts back there. And this gets back to who needs access to the data, who needs access to the visualizations, who needs access to which parts of the data, and how do they need access to that data, right? So this distributed version gives you, uh, in, in a lot of ways, gives you a more fault tolerant data collection architecture, right? Because it's unlikely that all of my edge devices are gonna go down at once. My network may go down, but at least I can store my data locally on those edge devices and I can generate alerts and I can keep the oil rig from catching fire and I can keep people from dying. And when the network comes back online, I can backhaul some of that data back to the data center so that the business people can see that, yay, we didn't explode today, right? And that's what they need to see is, yay, we didn't explode. I'm on the oil rig, I need to see that we're about to, and I need to see very highly granular data at really regular intervals, right? Back-end data center people, they just need to know that the, that the rig functioned all day then, and we were able to produce oil all day and nobody died and, and it's all good, right? And I, and I want to be able to see that from all of my oil rigs. I use a shop floor example as well, right? I have a person that is responsible for 10 machines in a shop floor, right? And they all have a bunch of sensors on it and they need a dashboard that shows that all 10 of those machines are functioning correctly and are not about to you know, have a, a bearing failure and everything's going okay, right? And they need that local machine access, they need that local data access, local dashboards, local alerting. And then you can feed that data, you can downsample that data and feed that data back into sort of a factory wide system. So the person who's responsible for the factory can see that all of the various areas of the, of the shop floor were working correctly and, and no alerts were generated and, and we're all good and, and we produced everything we were supposed to put, produce today, right? And then that data can be downsampled and fed back to a larger system where the person responsible for all the factories can see that all the factories were working correctly and I can do different dashboarding. So it's who needs access to what data and, and the immediacy of that data can really inform how you are gonna lay out your data architecture. So I think I already went over this, I, I just didn't get to the slide, right? Of deciding who needs the data where they need it, what are the costs involved in sending that you know, millisecond level temperature data all the way back to the cloud versus storing it locally. One of the things that you get with InfluxDB that you don't get with a lot of these other systems is that you can deploy the entire stack on very limited hardware. Um, you can deploy the entire stack on a Raspberry Pi very easily. Anybody remember the Intel Edison? No, you do? Yeah. Uh, long live the Edison, thank God it's gone. But it was a very small piece of hardware and I ran the entire Influx stack on that very small piece of embedded hardware. So I can deploy this stuff to a whole bunch of different locations in a whole bunch of different scenarios. And the nice thing about it is it's the same software, it's the same stack, it's the same deployment model, no matter where I'm doing it, whether it's on embedded hardware or it's on a multi-node, you know, server instance. So I'm gonna blind you with this slide because it really only works with a white background and I'm sorry about that. Um, so I can have a bunch of these sensors out here, right? And those sensors can feed back to a, a, you know, an access point, let's say. And that access point can feed it back into a, you know, over the internet to the cloud. And here's the cool part, right? I can use I can do telegraph to collect my data out on that edge node and I can run it in the cloud to collect all the data from those edge nodes, right? I can run InfluxDB on that edge node for short-term storage of my data and I can run it in the cloud for the long-term storage. So I can have both. I can run capacitor, as long as I'm not running the 2.0 stuff, I can run that out on the edge for my local alerts to keep my oil rig from catching fire. And I can do my sort of system-wide alerts running capacitor on the back end, right? 
And same thing with chronograph. I can have local dashboards out at the edge, and I can have sort of system-wide dashboards back in the data center. And again, it's the same software, it's the same stack, and it runs anywhere along that entire architecture, right? That's, there's a lot of actual value in having that same stack being multi deployed in multiple places, right? I don't have to have different people that are trained differently to go and deploy this stuff on the thing that's based in the wall versus the people that are deploying it in the data center. So, things that are really important. I, talk, I, I was actually talking to somebody yesterday about this. When people talk about the IoT, they generally talk about, you know, how many billions of devices are going to be deployed over the next 10 years, right? I don't know what number Gartner and Forrester are making up this week. It's probably somewhere between 20 and 50 billion devices in the next five to 10 years, right? It, the numbers vary when, you know, depending on how they feel that day. If you're a device manufacturer, that's really cool to know that number. But if you actually start to think about it, the number of devices is really kind of trivial in terms of what's going to happen with IoT. Because each of those devices is going to start generating a data stream, at least one data stream, typically anywhere between six and maybe 15 data streams per device, depending on how many sensors are on that device. So let's average it at 10 data streams per device. And if you go with 20 billion devices, each of them getting out 10 data streams, you're talking 200 billion data streams. Good luck with that. That's much more important number than the number of devices. What are you gonna do with that data? How are you gonna ingest all that data? How are you gonna store that data? How are you gonna analyze that data and, and react to that data, right? High volume data collection, high volume data acquisition, storage, analysis, and alerting is really key to making any of that work. Um, and it's actually the whole reason that I work at Influx Data is because I've been doing IoT for a really long time and the typical answer to what do you do with your data was some sort of, some version of mumble, something mumble analytics, right? But when you actually drill down to what are you storing it in and how are you gonna deal with it? You know, well, maybe I'm putting it in, you know, MongoDB. Good luck with that. How many people are doing MongoDB? Stop doing that. <laughs> really. Um, our benchmark test that were actually run by a third party, uh, MongoDB can ingest about 25,000 data points per second, which sounds great, right? Same exact hardware, same exact data set, InfluxDB does about 1.4 million data points per second, right? When you're talking this level of data coming at you know, this velocity, you need something that's gonna be able to ingest that data at that velocity for a sustained amount of time. The thing about IoT data is once I put that sensor out there and once I turn it on and it turns on its 10 data streams, it's never gonna stop. It's never gonna shut up ever, ever, right? Kind of like me up here. It is never gonna stop. So being able to handle that, not just immediately, but long-term, you know, for the next 20 years, is really important to how you acquire, store, analyze, visualize your data, right? So here's a, a little dashboard that I use um, for, and I, I have to, first of all, apologize. I generally have a demo that I run, and I have a bunch of sensors up here, and you can see there's a display up here that uh, shows you the uh, relative humidity and the temperature in this room, except that somebody dropped this repeatedly, so one of the seven segment displays is a little wonky. It's actually uh, 33C in here. Um, so one of the ones I normally run has a, a CO2 monitor in, in it. And yesterday I was running the CO2 monitor in the big room out there and we were at about 600 parts per million, which is actually quite good. Uh, and then um, it developed a short somewhere in it and it quit putting out data. And I, you know, 
3,000 miles from home and I don't have my soldering iron or any of my stuff, so I can't fix it right now. Sorry about that. Um, but this is a dashboard that I run and I'll do a short demo and I'll show you the dashboards that I run. The top one actually, it's, it says raw versus compensated CO2. And one of the things that I have been able to do with InfluxDB 2.0 uh, using Flux is what's called cross measurement math. So now I can do math across measurements. So I can take all of this data, I can take the temperature data and the pressure data that's coming from one sensor and storing it one place. And I can take the CO2 data that's coming from a different sensor and stored in a different measure, measurement. And I can compare those two and I can do an ideal gas law calculation in real time. So I can compensate the raw CO2 levels for temperature and pressure and basically calibrate the sensor in real time in the visualization which is really cool. I couldn't do that with, without Flux. So I can do that now. It's a, it's, it's a hairball of Flux right now, but it runs really well and I can, I can do an ideal gas law calculation in real time for, for my, gas cal my, my CO2 compensation. The other thing I get to do with all of this and it comes sort of free is I get to monitor the platform, right? Because if I'm collecting all this data and I'm storing it and I'm analyzing it and I'm doing alerts, it's really important to know that the platform that I'm running it on is also healthy. Right? Um, one of the things that I'm not showing in this dashboard, and it's because it hasn't shipped in Telegraph yet, because I haven't fixed the test suite so that it passes everything. It works, it just doesn't pass the test suite, um, is monitoring the Wi-Fi interfaces. Right? On a, remote embedded system that may have, you know, Wi-Fi connected sensors, it's really important to monitor that part of the infrastructure. Because if I've set a dead man alert on a, you know, a, a carbon monoxide detector that's way up in a vent somewhere, and I suddenly stop getting data from it, it makes a huge difference to me whether the sensor died or the Wi-Fi that was providing the connectivity to the sensor died, right? If the sensor died, I've got to roll a truck with a technician that's small enough to go up in the duct and get it and fix it and get back out, right? If it's the Wi-Fi, I just have to call somebody local and tell them to go kick the Wi-Fi router and it comes back up and everything's happy, right? But knowing the difference between those two is really important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, did, has, People gone to Flux talks already? Know a little bit about Flux? Because we've been talking about, I'm sure people have been talking about Flux all you know, the last couple of days. So I'm not gonna bore you too much, but it is supposed to be usable, readable, composable, contributable, which is actually co quite important. And part of the demo I'll show is, is a, a contribution that I've made to Flux uh, separately. So one last thing about IoT data. These three things I have said about IoT data for the last 15 years. It's gotta be timely. If I'm just collecting data and I'm not, and, it, and it's like it's you know, arriving 45 minutes late, then how useful is it, right? It's gotta be accurate. I need to know that it's accurate. And the most important thing is it's gotta be actionable. If I'm not taking action on the data that I'm collecting, then why am I collecting it, right? And the example I use for this is a, uh, a factory automation group that, that we talked to, and they were collecting all of this data and they weren't doing anything with it. So they were collecting vibrational analysis data on some of their machines, and one of their machines blew a bearing and it went down and it took the whole shop floor down for a week because they had to, oh no, the machine died, now we have to order the part and the part has to get here and then we have to fix it and now we can bring the shop floor back up and we just lost about a million dollars for having been shut down for a week. Turns out they were collecting the vibrational data, the vibrational analysis data and it would have told them had they been paying attention to it that that bearing was about to go, but they weren't doing anything with it. It wasn't actionable. Had they been paying attention to it, had it been actionable, they would have seen that it was about to go, 
They could have ordered the part, scheduled the maintenance, they could have shut the place down for maybe an hour while they replaced the part, and then brought it all back up and they would have lost maybe $10,000 instead of a million. Huge difference in making your data actionable and, and accurate and timely versus just collecting it, right? If you're just collecting it, you're just keeping disk storage companies in business and you're not helping yourself. And the whole point of IoT is to monitor the environment and, and your systems so that you can take action on that and get some business value out of it, right? So this was basically supposed to be a workshop, a hands-on workshop, right? And you were supposed to have Influx 2.0 installed before you got here, at least according to the prerequisites. But going through a hands-on exercise in the equivalent of 35 minutes is really, really tough to do. Um, so the, the last time I did a hands-on workshop involving installing and running and configuring Influx uh, 2.0, it was a three-hour workshop. And compressing that into 40 minutes is, is pretty tough, right? So there's a couple of ways that you can do this, of course. There's Docker. You can install the Docker container. You can just run that. Um, you can do a download and install on my Mac. I don't run it in Docker, I just download the binary and run the binary because whenever we do a spin of the 2.0 alpha, all I have to do is remove the old binary, install the new one, and, and go run that instead, right? Um, same thing for Linux. You can just run it locally. If you're on Windows, I, I apologize, We're, we don't really support Windows for running and especially for doing deployments of InfluxDB. And finally, you can go and sign up for a free account on the Influx2 cloud instance. And this is a pretty simple way to do it. Just go sign up for a cloud instance. You get a, it's, it's fairly limited in the amount of data that you can write to it and the retention policy that you get, but it's a great way to sort of test it out and write data to something and build some visualizations and see how you can use it, right? Um, and it's actually free. It's not give us a credit card and we'll let you use it for a while, at which point we'll start charging you. It's, it's free. You don't have to have a credit card to sign up and you can use it in limited form for as long as you want. And if you want to upgrade later, then, then we'll, we'll do that for you, right? It's all set up via the browser. So it's really simple to set up. It's a couple of clicks, um, you know, click getting started. Add a user, give the user a password, and a couple of other fields, and you're ready to go. And configure a data collector, right? So that you can start collecting data. Because what good is it without collecting data, right? And Telegraph is super simple to set up now. The database itself will generate a Telegraph configuration for you. And so all you have to do is run that configuration. Decide what you want to monitor. This is just going to set up sort of the monitoring of the platform, right? And it creates a telegraph configuration for you, and you can run that configuration and start pumping data into InfluxDB. Some really important points that I like to point out. As of 2.0, security is on by default and it can't be turned off. I've tried, it can't be turned off. Um, this is a good thing. And it's all, all of the access is token based, right? So any write to the database, any read from the database has to present a valid token or it will not succeed, right? Um, it, you can generate different kinds of tokens. So you can generate tokens for clients that are write only. All they can do is stream data into the database. You can generate tokens that are read write. And then you can generate sort of the Uber token that can do anything like create measurements and create uh, buckets and delete things and stuff like that. But every single request to the database has to include a token. 
and that's different in 2.0 than it was in 1.0, and that's actually kind of important for IoT access because each access from your IoT device has to include a token or it can't write to the database, right? We didn't install Telegraph, so all my slides will be available, by the way. So if you want to go through this later and, and sort of work through this, building the instance, you will have full access to the slides and how to do this, um, and you can work through all of this later, right? And I start Telegraph from the command line, and it starts writing data to InfluxDB immediately. And then I can go off and I can create dashboards, right? And I can actually create some, it, we, we ship with some templates for dashboards, like system metrics and other metrics that are shipped as templates. And you can just start one of those up and you can see how your, how your instance is running. So we have these pre-built system dashboards, right? We have some metrics of influx itself. Again, part of what's important when you're, if you have an IoT deployment is not just the data that you're writing, but you really need to monitor the whole platform, right? I need to make sure that the system it's running on is healthy and I need to make sure that the database is healthy, right? I need to monitor all of that, especially if my data collection is critical. Things like oil rigs that can explode you know, things that can have safety implications. I need to know that not only am I collecting and, and generating alerts based on that data, but I need to know that the system that it's running on is healthy and is not oversubscribed, and that the database that's, that's behind it all is also healthy, right? InfluxQL is dead, right? Well, long live Flux. Um, you can now use Flux with the uh, 1.x line as well, right? TickScript is dead, and we've moved to tasks. I don't know anybody, I have not met anybody yet that will miss TickScript. Um, if you will miss TickScript, feel free to raise your hand. I won't shame you, but I certainly won't. Um, we've been through this. So some things to keep in mind as you're moving to flux is everything's now a bucket. All of your data goes into buckets, right? And we use this pipe forward operator to chain things together, to chain operations together in flux. And everything is returned in tables. So if you're using the chronograph front end, one of the little buttons that you'll see as you're building your query is you can click a little button and it says show raw data. And when you do that, what you see are tables because now everything is returned in tables. And depending on what you're querying, you may be returned multiple tables for a single query, right? So here's a quick example, you know, Always have a time range. I think if you were in Tim's talk uh, before lunch, you will understand the importance of having a time range. Not having a time range can very easily send you into the out of memory OOM loop, right? Because you'll just bring the machine to its knees. Um, and then I'm gonna filter on measurement. So I'm gonna get the CPU and the field, the usage system, and I only want the CPU total, and then I'm gonna call yield. Now in chronograph, in the UI, you don't actually have, have to call yield. The UI assumes that the last thing to do is call yield and it will do that for you. What used to be called, you know, capacitor is now being handled by flux tasks. And a flux task is basically just a flux query that is run at intervals. And that interval is completely configurable. So this demo that I have running, I have a bunch of tasks for CPU, for gas, for humidity and temperature. And I'm sorry that this is so small. Um, I've actually written an output from flux 
to MQTT. So now I can query the database and I can get back values and I can write those values out to MQTT basically as alerts. So what I have up here is um, I have a CO2 sensor that's no longer measuring CO2. And I have a temperature, humidity, and uh, atmospheric pressure and light sensor that's actually working. And those are sending data directly to InfluxDB. And they're actually sending data directly to an InfluxDB instance that is running in a data center. I have a, a server in a data center back in North America, and it's writing all that data directly to that data center. And then I've got these tasks running that are querying that data roughly every four seconds and writing out an alert to an MQTT broker, which this thing is listening to. So it's telling me that we are at 62.3% uh, relative humidity. I don't know if that's good or bad for London, but it's better than it was yesterday when it was raining. Um, and we're at 33 degrees in here. And you'll, if you've been watching this, you'll probably have noticed that it changes every now and then. It's going to be 23. You think it's 23? Yeah. Okay, so there's, I'll, I'll, I'll have to admit to this now. Um, <laughs> the temperature sensor's in this little box, and this little box has a small processor in it that generates a fair amount of heat. So it's actually off by about eight degrees, right? Um, so you caught me on that one. Um, but if I breathe into the box, there's uh, about a five to seven second delay. We should see those numbers start to change in some direction at least. Yeah, we'll see. So let's actually, uh, let me go to the demo. Oh, yeah. No, we, we were right. We were at 23. It's at 20, it says it's at 24 now. Um, and there was a small spike in, in humidity right here. You, so you can see these dashboards. These are real-time dashboards, right? One of the things I did um, with these, and, and I think it's the reason that this thing had a short and, and no longer will read CO2, is um, I redid these last week so that they don't have to be plugged in to actually work. And so not only <coughs> down here, you'll see I have some, these sensors are actually monitoring their own battery health and they're updating their battery health and it appears that this one the reason that one's not updating anymore is because it has lost its mind and is no longer reporting data so I can reset it um, and you'll see that the co2 is re reporting no results and that's because it's shorted out and the sensor is no longer working so it runs through a test pattern finds Wi-Fi and remembers what it's supposed to be looking for. Right. 62.31, and what do you know? We're at 62.31, right? So it's a, this is basically a complete IoT, not very useful IoT deployment, right? I'm collecting this data, I'm storing it, I'm actually going, I'm not doing local, local collection and storage. I'm sending it all the way back to a data center halfway across the planet. And then I'm sending my alerts back here uh, so that I can sort of monitor all of this, right? Um, it's kind of important with things like CO2. Um, it turns out that, and I'm really, I'm, I'm really upset that my CO2 monitor isn't working because it's really handy to have. I, I travel with it and I take it to meetings and I always run it during meetings because there are certain things that happen to human beings based on CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Um, and over about a thousand parts per million, 
uh, research has shown that uh, decision making is compromised. It turns out if you're in a small conference room with a bunch of people like having a, a business meeting in a small, small conference room, typically the CO2 concentration in that room is about 1,200 parts per million, 1,500 parts per million. So you're having a meeting and by definition, decision making is compromised. I was giving this workshop in uh, Spain last month and in the room, it was very poorly ventilated. We had about half this many people in a room about a quarter this size, and CO2 was at 3,200 parts per million, and it was really tough to keep people awake because people start to nod off at about 2,500 parts per million. People really start to be unable to concentrate. So um, that's actually why I typically use that sensor, and that's why I'm so annoyed that it's not working, right? I was actually thinking, since I can't do my ideal gas law calculation, I was thinking one of the things I would do is I would, we would sort of live code a, uh, you know, the heat index, right? The temperature versus humidity to get the, the heat index. And we could do that in flux and we could get the heat index. So I went during the break and looked up what is the calculation to get the heat index? And that's the calculation from the US National Weather Service to get the heat index. And so I said, we are not doing that in real time. <laughs> not because it's not possible, it's just a real pain. And doing that in flux is not something that I would like to do in real time and inflict on you. Right. So I, I hope you appreciate that I'm not inflicting that on you. I am just about out of time. So here's my task example in something that you can read, right? I'm, I've got a range. I'm looking for the measurement that I want. I'm sending it to MQTT. And this MQTT part of Flux, I need to give it the broker, the topic, a client ID and the format and the values. And it will then send that information out to the MQTT broker. It's really handy. This will be coming in a future version of Flux. Uh, again, I just have to finish the test suite. Um, so we'll get to that. If you are writing in Arduino, if you're playing with Arduinos, um, there is a library for writing directly to InfluxDB. That library has now been updated for InfluxDB 2.0. And basically, now you have to set the bucket, set the version, set the organization, set the port, and set the token. Once you've done those things, you can create a row to go into the database. You can add your values, add your tags, and you can either write single rows or you can prepare them into batch mode and write a batch. And that will go directly to InfluxDB. It's super simple to do. That's, as you can see, well, it's, you know, you can do it in very few lines of code depending on how many values and how many tags you want to add, right? This is actually exactly from this sensor of how I'm getting the data from this sensor into the database. And in fact, I created two instances of the influx object, one for writing to my local laptop here and one for writing to the data center. So it writes to both at once. So that if Wi-Fi is down going to the internet, I can at least run it locally. It will write to the local database, and those two data, those two, the local and the remote one, get the same data at the same time, right? And if the remote one fails, I don't care because it's going locally. And I finished almost in time. Do I have questions? Yes. Um, what is the decision to directly write the index into InfluxDB rather than putting an MQTT broker? between and um, using Telegraph? That is a, it's, that's 
comes down to a sort of a personal choice or an architecture decision, right? Do I, do I want to write directly to the database? Do I think I need an interme intermediary like MQTT or Telegraph? And I've done both, right? Um, depending on, you know, just how I felt that day. All of the, all of the above work, right? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So when I've done the, the you know, this uh, multi-tiered deployment, what I typically see and, and what I recommend is, so syncing it to the cloud is, I don't necessarily need or want to send that really, really, you know, millisecond level data to the cloud. So downsample it, right? And I can downsample that, and especially in Flux, I can downsample that, and I can write it to, write it out to InfluxDB, and I can actually write it out to a remote instance of InfluxDB. So I can just ship it off that way, right? There are other things that I could do to compensate for uh, um, network availability. Uh, we have an integration with Apache NiFi, so I can use that. I can use Kafka to pipeline things. So there's different ways to compensate for whether or not I have a reliable backhaul network or not. Um, but typically, I'm going to downsample my data before I send it back to uh, an upstream instance. Right? There was another question over here. Yeah, same question. Oh, so I got that one? Yeah, so Enterprise talks about mirroring capabilities. Is that what you're referring to? No. Um, Mostly because when I'm talking about uh, storing it at the edge, I'm talking about doing it in a small embedded environment. And having an enterprise version with, you know, means I'm basically trying to build a, like a Raspberry Pi cluster to have an enterprise version running at the edge, which you can do. But usually a single instance, you know, open source version at the, at the extreme edge is fine. Um, and then, no, you're not going to have this, you know, a cluster to, to sync your data across. So you're going to have to find another way to downsample and, and upstream your data. Yes. But is there, it, uh, connects to that question, is there a mechanism to have automated replication? So if my backhaul dies and I'm missing two hours of data, it only replicates those two hours, or do I have to implement an own mechanism? This? Right now, you have to implement your own mechanism for that from an open source version to an enterprise version. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, for downsampling, do we still use the continuous queries? Or since we have tasks now, would it be a task? Basically, a task is now a continuous query. So yeah, you'd use a task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. Uh, we're going to have the uh, continuous queries. We're going to still have them, right? I believe that continuous queries, are, and uh, I don't know if we have one of the engineers in the room to answer this question. I believe that it, continuous queries are going to be are basically turned into tasks now that you just run at a at a very high frequency. Yeah. That's how we do the dumps down something, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your coming today. Thanks. Thank you.